I'm starting with this image created by Marty Tubles about, obviously, the Dakota Access Pipeline. Because if you think about water, uh, water campaigns, this is certainly the most compelling one we have seen on a national stage in quite a while. And um, it's, I offer this because this is a very compelling image, even, that, that um, you know, pulls together a lot of the reasons that the Dakota Access fight has been, um, had had such a big reach. One of the reasons they've had such a big reach is that they have a very compelling story. Um, this is something that obviously affects a lot of people, and there, there is incredibly strong imagery. But that's not necessarily always the case when it comes to a lot of the issues that you all are talking about here today and that you work with. Um, might we maybe don't have the same kind of incredibly strong imagery uh, with issues, issues related to invasive species and stormwater management. Also, it can be challenging to get your, your various audiences to really understand how this is so relevant to them and important to them. And so, in that situation, it's important to think about how to uh, employ some best practices for your communication efforts to really engage broader audiences with regard to water issues. I am the executive director for Metcalf Institute at the University of Rhode Island, and this is precisely the intersection that we live in. So we want to help foster these informed public conversations about environmental issues, both the challenges, solutions, and especially from our perspective, we're interested in getting the science across accurately and in context. Um, so we do this by building bridges between journalists and scientists and other science communicators, such as nonprofit staff or um, um, agency staff even. And we've been doing science training programs for journalists for 19 years now and communication training for about six years to reach a, a variety of audiences. And so I'm going to share with you some of the things we've learned along the way and also best practices that a lot of uh, social scientists have, have been able to pull together based on their research. Here's our context, right? Um, in case you can't read the small print at the bottom, this cartoon is a kind of a Jeopardy-style game show called Facts Don't Matter. And the, the host is saying, I'm sorry, Jeannie, your answer was correct, but Kevin shouted his incorrect answer over yours, so he gets the points. More than ever, we really need to engage new people in conversations about environmental issues. And um, we need to do it in ways that are not off-putting, that are respectful, and that get information across in interesting ways. Unfortunately, Many of us, and Professor Frank from The Simpsons here represents um, the more technical folks among us, tend to use words and phrases that are meaningless to most people. Ecosystem services, just don't ever say that phrase when you're talking to a person who's not a scientist because they will never ever know what it means. Um, and other things here that I've listed, and we could list many, many more. So our language often just immediately turns people off. And, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. Because, you know, you know average Joe citizen here um, is not going to be thinking about ecosystem services or why you should be maintaining stream flow or other, you know, kinds of uh, scientific thoughts about this necessarily. They're probably thinking, what does this mean to me? How is this relevant to my life? Do I have to pay money for this? Um, uh, is there something I can do about this? Um, and also, I, I have this beautiful GIF here by Javier Lopez that I love. This is the hydrologic cycle that she has put together in a GIF. Art is an incredibly effective way to share your message. And I urge you to be inspired by what this woman has achieved here. So how do we make people pay attention and care? about these issues. Well, the Girl Scouts are leading the way once again. I, when I was putting together this presentation, I was, you know, Googling around water ambassadors, water protection, water protectors, and uh, this, this badge, this water ambassador badge came up. And this is one of the badges that Girl Scouts can get when they're more senior in their Girl Scout careers. And to, to earn that badge, they have to do these five things listed here. Reflect on their relationship with water, celebrate or create water art, learn about water issues, explore solutions, educate and inspire. I think that sounds like a really wonderful set of goals for all of us when we're trying to engage 
new water ambassadors. So thanks to the Girl Scouts for helping us identify some of these goals. But how do we actually achieve that? Well, let's start by saying how we can't achieve it. And that is by throwing information at people. So there's been a lot of work among social scientists about the so-called deficit model of communication. And the idea there is that people who don't understand a particular issue, whether it's an environmental issue or, or something entirely different, have a deficit of information. And if only we can you know, fill up their, their um, containers with information, their brains with information, then they'll understand it, they'll get it, they'll act on it, because it's the rational thing to do. Well, it's a very scientific way of thinking about the world, but unfortunately it's not how people act. We act, each one of us, based upon um, our experiences, our values, our biases, all of those things together determine how we make up our minds about something. Even those of us who have a more scientific or technical bent, we still apply those things to some degree. So um, what has been shown over and over again with a lot of research is that this deficit model of communication, throwing information at people, is not the way to go. Rather, you have to engage people. You have to have a conversation. You need to explore your audience's interests, their biases, their, their backgrounds, et cetera, their perspectives respectfully and have a conversation that helps them get to a point where they do have information, but they also can fit it into their own scheme in their brains in terms of how they view the world. With that in mind, and that's the basic premise for everything I'm going to talk about going forward, the first step to engaging these new water protection ambassadors is to figure out who it is you're talking with. Your audience could be all kinds of people. It could be journalists, as Alex mentioned. It might be people who, in fact, are already the converted, so to speak, but you're trying to get them to do something very specific with regard to how they um, use fertilizer, for example. Um, maybe there is some referendum coming up, and you want to persuade people to vote a particular way in that referendum. Or maybe you're talking to policymakers, and you want them to create some policy that's actually useful with regard to water protection. Whatever it is, you need to spend serious time thinking about who it is very specifically you're trying to reach whenever you're trying to communicate with or engage an audience. And what do they know already? And what do they care about? What are they interested in? Once you have really figured out who your audience is, then you need to take the next step of asking, what exactly am I trying to achieve in my communication with that audience? Do I want to inform them within the context of engagement? Do I want to um, persuade them to, um, to practice a particular type of behavior or to support a policy or whatever? Do I want to spur them to action? Whatever it is, you need to be really clear for yourself on exactly what it is you're trying to achieve with that engagement. The next steps then are to think, well, OK, so what makes for effective science communication. If you are engaging people, you've selected your audience, and you know what you're trying to achieve in terms of your communication. Um, well, we need to, as I said before, really be, be aware and um, kind of cognizant of what our audience is interested in, what they're thinking about, and help them understand the science, the technical information, whatever it is. Um, that is relevant to their decision-making process, helping them get to a place where they feel comfortable making an informed decision about how to act or how to get involved. So I'm going to offer three points that are really essential to keep in mind when you are trying to engage new water protection ambassadors. And the first one is clarity. Um, you want to make sure that you, like I said, know who your audience is and recognize that you can't Generally, you can't reach many different audiences at the same time. You need to really target your, your messages so that um, it is reaching a particular audience. Now, you could have a campaign where you have several different messages, say two or three messages within that campaign, and they might be designed to really appeal to a couple different audiences. But you need to be incredibly thoughtful and strategic to achieve that kind of goal. Often, it's much more effective in the long run to really focus on one audience at a time. 
So limiting your messages is a big deal. Of course, entirely avoiding jargon. And I, this was brought home to me um, while I was, I've been reading this book that takes place in England. And there was an entire chapter that was all about a cricket game. I don't know anything about cricket. And it was all cricket jargon, hardcore cricket jargon. I didn't understand anything in this entire chapter. And I'm one of these people that doesn't like to skip a book. You know, like I feel like even if I'm reading and I missed a word because I was daydreaming or whatever, I have to go back and reread re that sentence because I feel guilty otherwise. I skipped the chapter. I couldn't do it because I didn't care about the cricket jargon. So keep this in mind, you know, whether it's cricket or it's um, something related to the, the technical aspects of your work, jargon just puts people off. And then framing is a really valuable way to be clear in how you are talking about an issue. And I'm going to offer you um, an example of a way to practice your framing. So this is a message box. There are a lot of different groups that develop message boxes. Compass is an organization um, that has been working on science communication for a long time. And they have really um, honed this idea. And so I offer their example. It's a good one. You can find this on compassonline.org. So the approach here is, first you start in the center of this box with your issue. And this is the simplest um, way to describe whatever it is you're trying to get across. Here's, here's my concern, my issue. Um, I want to, um, I'm, I'm concerned about, um, you know, invasive species in my local lake. Um, and, and what particular invasive you're talking about. So then you kind of move through this box. You start perhaps at the top and say, what are the problems that we're trying to resolve here? Why does this issue matter? Um, and then once you've written some of those problems down, you might go over to the so what box. Who cares that there are these problems that I see as problems or that my colleagues might see as problems? Um, how do I convince my audience, and this is all designed, this entire message box starts with selecting your audience. Um, so how do I know that they care about this? And then once you've got your so what questions, you can go on to possible solutions to the problems related to this issue, and then on to the benefits of resolving these problems. What you want to do is keep simplifying, clarifying your message over and over again by asking yourself, so what? Why? So what? Why? Until you've come up with something um, using this, this message box that is really a very clear and concise um, kind of uh, suite of, of points that you can make if you're trying to engage new folks in, in your issues. The second major piece to this after clarity is having a compelling story to tell. And I, I mentioned, of course, the Dakota Access Pipeline. There's a lot that's compelling about that story. But the, the general tips for being compelling are first to be relevant to your audience. Um, if you understand that audience, you'll have a better idea of what is relevant to them. Um, to use emotion, and again, as someone who's trained as a scientist, I understand that, that this is anathema to a lot of people um, from a scientific bent, but there are times and places to use emotion. And I'm, I don't mean, you know, knocking people over the head and using sad puppy dog faces. I mean, identify the fact that sometimes there is a lot of emotion tied up in, in some of the issues you're working with, and that's okay. You should recognize that it's appropriate at some times to um, kind of harness that emotion for the purpose of telling a compelling story. And then also um, using different media. So again, I'm going to make my pitch for public art here. And, and of course, many of us have seen um, you know, perhaps little placards near storm drains to remind people that the, the runoff is going to a body of water. Um, but there are so many ways now that you can use images, um, art, fine art, as well as street art, um, you know, sound, um, even tactile things. There's this amazing artist I know who, she's a sculptor, and she, she builds, she weaves baskets that, that tell stories of environmental change. I'll tell you more if you're interested after, after the talk, but it's, she has managed to pull together a lot of really technical information into a tactile object and tell a really interesting story. So these are some of the, the pieces to telling a compelling story. And of course, of course framing um, uh, your message is a big part of that too.
The next thing to think about, the third piece here, is, is fostering dialogue. And this, again, underscores the importance of engaging audiences, bringing them together. And the first part of that is to be a good listener. Some, some people are naturally really good listeners. Some of us are not naturally really good listeners. It is a skill that I urge you to practice. Um, but, but part of that engagement, that dialogue, is being responsive to whomever it is you're trying to reach and um, working as hard as you can to build trust with them. The more trust you have, the more they're going to believe what you're saying. And then the other thing is you need to be aware of your mental models. So is anybody familiar with this mental model concept? A couple of people. Great. Okay. So for, I figured that was going to be the case. So I want to give you an example of what a mental model is. This is how kind of the, um, the automatic response we have in our own minds based upon our experiences, our biases, our perspectives about a particular issue. So I'm going to give you a little experiment here to show you what I mean. I'm going to show a word on this next slide. And when you see that word, I want you to just think of the first thing that comes into your mind. Don't overthink it. The first image that comes into your mind when you see that word. Okay. All right, stop. You got your image. That's it. I want you to think about this no more. Okay. So depending upon who you are and how you feel about cats, maybe you had a very nice, happy thought. Or maybe you had a sad thought. Or maybe you had a painful thought. Or maybe you had an annoyed thought, you know? Because this is sort of the spectrum of how people feel about cats. And this is a great example of how people can think about more complex ideas. Um, you get something in your head, and it can be hard to get outside of your own mental model. So when you're trying to engage new water protection ambassadors, you need to be aware of your own mental models and the fact that sometimes you might say something to a person that makes perfect sense in your head and you know exactly what that means but the person you're talking with or the group you're talking with might have absolutely no idea or or they might have a, kind of an opposite response to yours so mental models are are really important and um, something to keep in mind the last really important message that i want to leave you with here is that you need to practice. And Kate is going to offer you a lot more information about social media as a means for practicing. Um, and I, uh, so I won't talk about that, but um, this cartoon here, you can tell it I like to give talks via cartoons, is another fantastic reminder of, the, of our need to get out of what has been called our filter bubbles, meaning you know, we need to start talking to new audiences to share um, uh, our, our perspectives, our concerns. And uh, with regard to water protection issues, we certainly need to engage much broader communities. So don't always talk to pigs if you're a pig. Talk to ducks periodically, you know, because those ducks are going to look at the world differently than the pigs are. And, um, and sometimes when pigs talk to ducks, they're going to immediately disagree with one another. I urge you to try to move past that, um, that initial response or initial feeling. Um, and one of the ways you can practice this is um, not just talking with, with different groups, but also by um, offering uh, your thoughts in op-eds, um, writing letters to the editor. Um, these are really great ways to practice your communication skills, to practice engaging broader audiences using all of the, the strategies that I've discussed here. I'll leave you with this idea. I, I love this photo because it's absolutely right on the money. Often people think about storytelling as making things up, but this is an, a kind of an outmoded way to think about communicating. Stories are how humans have been connecting with one another for millennia. And we understand storytelling because it assumes that you are paying attention to the person you're talking with, that you're listening to them, they're listening to you, you're thinking about things that are interesting. So we have to tell stories, factual stories that are interesting, um, because those stories spur the action that spurs the next action that spurs the next action you know it is only through this kind of real engagement and communication
between humans so that we can um, achieve some kind of forward motion with regard to water protection.